Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Boone, um, and I am a Principal UX Research Lead at Xbox Research. And I, today, I'm going to be talking about soaring into the golden age of social science. So I believe that we're in the age of social science. But first, let's talk about the age of tech. I'm sure that many of you have a story of watching that shift happen yourselves, can recall where you were in your lives and careers. My story is oddly, in part, told through the perspective of being a volunteer college counselor. I've been a volunteer college counselor since I was in college myself, and part of that role was helping aspiring college students select a major. This meant that I got a window into what the youth were doing in those days, at least in my pocket of the world. At the time, the hot careers and majors at the time were things like finance and real estate and law. Computer science was kind of shunted off to the corner. It was what even the nerdier nerds than I was did, and I was a nerd. <laughs> but that seemingly changed overnight towards the end of my own college years. See, I am two years younger than Mark Zuckerberg, and I graduated in 2008 into the Great Recession. Suddenly, computer science and engineering were the hottest majors. Technology became king, and being a nerd was suddenly cool, and everything came about how far we could push the tech. Games went through our age of tech too. Actually, I would say this isn't new. And we actually went through it maybe a little bit earlier than the rest. Today, we all talk about flops. But back in my day, I remember this being all about bits and graphics. We talked about looking at the graphics, how realistic they were, and ray tracing. And now we're talking about streaming latency measured in milliseconds. The game, the industry, the innovation, became about how high we could technically soar, how lifelike and real we could make it, how far we could push the boundaries of computer science and technology to make incredibly powerful and magical gaming experiences. And that's still a big part of the game. We're still here to and still tasked with making this the most innovative and cutting edge gaming experiences ever. But, there's also been a shift. Something changed. One might say a metamorphosis began. Bottom fell out, or the sides bust in tech and games get people all over it. An activity that used to be portrayed and viewed as primarily a solitary thing, that old canard of a guy alone in their basement, the exclusive purview of dorks and nerds, exploded into the mainstream and turned into something that was increasingly seen as social. We started seeing more and more coverage of the social nature of tech and the rise of social gaming. We got people all up in our tech and with them, all of the complex problems that people and their weird identities and relationships bring. We're beginning to recognize the diversity that's always existed in our audiences and player bases and sought to diversify it even more via the stories we tell, the settings we design and the worlds that we build, which leave us grappling with new challenges like how to ensure relatable and well done representation. We've seen people using our platforms to speak out and organize for social movements of many kinds, which leaves us grappling with the tensions that bloom and how to handle those convoluted and messy uh, social dynamics. As gaming becomes more and more social and sharing rises, we see increased concerns about privacy, leading to regulations that affect everyone in our interconnected world. And as we've begun to recognize more and more what's happening to our climate and our world and realize the impact of gaming and our responsibility as an industry to reduce and perhaps reverse that impact. These are the questions that tech and that games, our industry, are asking ourselves right now. It's not that there are any, aren't any interesting technical problems. There always will be, of course. 
and we'll be there to help answer those as well. But so many of the challenges and opportunities that are facing our industry hinge on questions that are deeply intertwined with the user experience. This is the golden age of social science. This is our moment. Now, is this somewhat blatant pandering to my own manager's 2019 keynote at this very conference? Yes, a little bit, yes. But it was also inspired by an article published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences early last year that was also titled The Golden Age of Social Science. It's a theory and a hope that as the biggest challenges that face tech and games become increasingly social rather than just about technical advances, the prominence and visibility of social science and user experience will grow. I think that we're already beginning to see that as more and more stories of the challenges that rise in tech have come out, often accompanied by a story of a user experience expert being ignored or sidelined. As an industry, we've built all the things and we're polishing all the things and we're reaching higher heights in tech stack every year. But we, as user experience researchers and professionals, are uniquely equipped to guide our game development teams through this moment. We're the best ones, in fact, because we understand people and we understand data. And those are two things that tech and games just got a whole lot of. But I think that for us to get there and to truly claim that mantle of leadership, we're gonna have to transform how our partners and our stakeholders see us, which means we're also gonna have to transform how we see ourselves not only as crucial developmental support bringers of data to game development teams, but as purveyors of deep expertise, as storytellers who illuminate, as oracles who can uncover buried treasure of social patterns and predict the future. I'll tell you how I got there. Some of the things that I learned along the way of my own metamorphosis in this industry, well, just like all of you, trying to tackle these kinds of problems that made me think that this is our moment. The debate over the democratization of data about whether everyone in a development team should have access to and facility with user data is really big in our field right now, especially right around us, user experience professionals. Um, there was actually a debate about it last year right here at this conference. Hold on to your butts, it's called, if you wanna watch it. There are lots of arguments on either side. This idea that this is simply how science advances, that it frees us up to do other work versus fears of misinterpreted data and missed opportunities to build credibility and relationships with our stakeholders. But honestly, I think the one that I hear the most often is both outside and inside of my own brain is maybe our teams will need us less. At some level, the conversation about the democratization of data feels like the battle for the soul and existence of our field. Our place of importance on our dev teams is hard won, built painstakingly over the course of the two plus decades that our field has been around the planet. If we're giving away our secrets, maybe they'll perceive us to be of less value. It's a tangible fear, but data and research is already democratized. Our teams already have more data from more sources than they could ever want or even know what to do with. We could never hope to stem the tide of data that they have access to. User feedback and connection is more democratized too. Any team can easily put together multiple ways to connect with their users, whether it's jumping into or starting a Reddit thread for feedback, posting a poll to their fans on Twitter, or building a longer form survey in Typeform or SurveyMonkey or one of the other free survey tools out there. And with the rise of even more remote research tools, our teams could theoretically meet and talk to our players anywhere. I always say to myself, I'm not gonna try to prevent my teams from talking to their own players. They're gonna do it anyway. And they should, because the value that I, that we bring to development teams is not data. It's insight, it's interpretation, it's storytelling, it's context, it's the expertise. We can teach our teams techniques and help them write survey questions, but learning to see the patterns underlying human behavior is different from raw technique. It's when a team tells you they wanna put the blinky indicator light on the HUD right there in that upper right corner of the screen and you instantly tell them they're not gonna see that because you know 
They won't. That doesn't come from simply learning a few usability techniques in the lab. I don't have to go to the lab to know this because I know how people think. We know how people perceive and behave. Feels a little like predicting the future. That comes from years of studying and understanding human behavior. That comes from expertise. So I believe that we should democratize data, but republicize insight. Okay, think about it. Democracy is when all the people have access to and share the power. In this case, the data is the power. Yes, our teams are always gonna have access to data. They're always gonna talk to their players and they're naturally gonna hear things directly from them. That's democratizing data. Everyone gets a little bit of that people power all at once. That's a good thing. But data on its own is not magic. There's still sense making. There's explaining the mechanisms. There's delving into the whys and the hows. There's explaining how the what is is different from what could be. There's even a little bit of predicting the future of using what we see to divine what we might see, what could happen to some degree of accuracy. Everyone has the data. But we, as the ones who are wallowing in it and thinking and breathing this stuff, are best equipped to provide the insights, which is really what our partners want, even if that's not what they know how to ask for. We become a data republic, where our expertise lies as being that representative when it comes to insight and interpretation. We are the ones who will help them make sense of the information collected, of the interactions and the relationships that are being negotiated in this social gaming world. And we're the ones that bring expert knowledge of our audiences, current and future, to the table. Still a democracy, everyone gets the access, just that we're gonna be the ones to make sure that the underlying meaning behind the data gets ferried and communicated to the people. We are the liaison between the data, and of course, by extension, our users, and the people, our dev team. A couple of years back, I worked with a team with which I did a lot of on-site research. We were always going to special events to teach players about their game, to watch how they played with it. Uh, the team, of course, always wanted to come along to these. In fact, wanted to come along is the wrong language because they were usually the ones bringing me along to one of their events because they wanted to see what my insight was. And I couldn't very well tell them not to talk to their own participants at their events. But as a scientist, I couldn't help but notice all the ways that they could get better insights and information from their players with a few tweaks. So before heading off to another conference with the team, I offered them a little conference prep session. I knew that they'd be talking to lots of players to try to gather information about their experiences playing games and communities. And I knew they'd be spending a lot of time watching their players play and trying to derive some insight about how they experienced the game. So, I zeroed in on teaching them some techniques to help them out with the basics of interviewing and some basic usability tactics. I'm definitely not the first person to do this with the dev team. We've done lots of customer empathy sprints before. In fact, I got most of the materials that I used to do this for my mentor, JJ. Thanks, JJ. Uh, but I was still super nervous about it for the same reasons that I think all of us get a little twitchy whenever democratization of data comes up. What if they then decided that they no longer needed it? Well, I barreled into it anyway, discussing all the basic tips and tricks that we all know and love of working directly with users, introducing them to our old friends. I'm not testing you, I'm testing the product. And can you say more about that? And what would you expect to happen? And about two thirds of the way into this prep meeting, one of the PMs on the team stopped me with a very concerned look on her face and said, should we even be doing this? I was a little confused, but she went on to explain how they never realized how much expertise and thought went into interviewing people and gathering information from them. And now they were wondering if they should just completely bow out and leave this all to the experts. They didn't completely. We finished the session. And of course, they talked to their players and they still got directly data from them, just like they wanted. But they still wanted me to do the research. They still asked me to do targeted research for that specific event and others beyond it. In fact, if anything, 
they had a whole new respect for the UX skill set. Not just the ability for me to deliver their data, but realizing that there was a right way to do that. And the value that I brought them wasn't just the information itself, but how I obtained and interpreted that information distilled it to them in a format that they could understand, and then gave them some directional recommendations that were based on both my knowledge of how humans think and behave and of their game. Even when we're giving other people our stuff, the way in which we share that information can help them realize that there is a complexity and an art to our craft. If we're just a source of data, we're easily replaceable by Twitter polls and telemetry. We're easily crowded out by the sheer overwhelming amount of data out there to which our partners and dev teams have access. But I argue that that's not actually what they're looking for at all. Even again, they don't know how to ask for it. When I started working in accessibility inclusive design, like a good quantitative scientist, the first things I started looking into were the numbers, in large part because everyone was asking me for the numbers. How many are in this group? How many women gamers do we have? How many people with this kind of disability? What's our audience size? How many monthly active users are we gonna add if we do this thing? They wanted the facts and figures and numbers to try to explain to their teams and their leads why they wanted to insert that accessibility feature or build that representation story into the narrative, why they should spend the dev and narrative cycles on this. So I found them the numbers and I gave them the numbers, but I also found that the numbers weren't that compelling on their own. I get into a lot of conversations like this where a team would ask me for a number, like how many people in our audience are deaf or hard of hearing? And I tell them what the answer is like, oh, about 4%. And then they'd have some kind of generally underwhelmed response to those stats. And yeah, that number is kind of small, but I found that I got this kind of reaction no matter how big the number was. In fact, I start all of my inclusive design workshop presentations with, there are 1 billion people in the world with a disability. And that's usually received within, oh, for all of the things that we investigate, and especially for those big, meaty, challenging problems of our time, like diversity, inclusion, accessibility, sustainability, privacy, the simple data in and of itself isn't what persuades people here, it's the context that we can provide for our teams, the deep and intimate knowledge of our players and audiences that we can deliver because of our expertise. It's the ability that we have to amplify their voices and help tell their stories. Because data changes minds, maybe, but storytelling is really what changes people's hearts and motivates them to change. And we know this because we've seen this before in some of our most core methods. The greatest weapon that we all have is neither sword nor shield, but usability video. You all know this. It's that sweet, perfect clip that shows the participant throwing their controller across the room in a rage, or a sweet seven-year-old child participant reading us all for absolute filth in the lab. Or the quote that says something like, everything about this is telling me that you don't want me to use your thing. You know, we're sometimes good things. We, we tell our teams good things too sometimes. Those are all elements of story. They ground the team within context. They make the data on the paper come to light. The stories help other people see what we see when we stare at some stats output or community feedback with a ridiculous grin on our faces, because it's the story that we've already, without even thinking about it, reached in and pulled out to the top mentally because of our expertise. So as I continue to work with teams and teach them these workshops and tell them about inclusive design, they still wanted an ax for stats and numbers, and I gave them that, but I paired it with context, with stories. I still show them the slide and I talk about the 1 billion people, but I also show them a longer version of this video where they can watch a quadriplegic player using a quad stick absolutely dominate in PUBG, which is not something that any of them expected to see. And that's where I start to see the wows coming. This is where people start to get excited about the possibilities for accessibility in their game. 
And then in the workshop itself, they get a chance to talk to just four players with disabilities. I sometimes have teams that are a little bit skeptical about this. They're like spending two days talking to a few people. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, but they do it. And then they have a chance to talk to those folks and hear their stories and their lives, to see them as people in context. Then we help them make sense of it together as a team, distilling those learnings down into insights, helping the team tell the story of what they learned together. And then our conversations start to look a little more like this. What I wasn't expecting to happen was to get very emotional hearing their feedback. I wanted to make a game for Bennett and David and Catherine and Wesley, accessibility advisors. By the end of our first day, it's not fair that they can't play our games. As the ones who are immersed in this every single day, as the ones who have built up the muscle to see those patterns, to recognize and pull up those stories, we're the best ones to amplify our players' thoughts and behaviors and experiences and to help our teams make sense out of those by transforming data into insight, by amplifying stories, and with our expertise in some interpretation, to maybe tell them what's gonna happen before it does. We're oracles. We're griots. Yes, we listen to what's actually happening with our players, but we don't just lay it raw at our team's feet. We tell stories about the patterns of reality so that others can derive truth from it. We document the ties that bind us and the behaviors that define us so that we can help figure out where we might go next. Well, oracles were storytellers. They were also advisors who answered the questions of kings and philosophers. Griots are storytellers, and they are also leaders who dispense wise counsel and interpret signs for royalty. If insight and stories have that kind of power, and those who wield them well can wield that power too, well then we have that power. Randy once asked me if I had to come up with a way to explain the magic of user research to a high level executive, to tie together this confluence of expertise, insight, and context. How would I do that? What would I tell them? And I said that I thought it was that we can see the matrix. We can see the patterns underlying our reality. As humans, our reality is social constructed. It's built together by all of us. And as user experience professionals, we're trained to look beyond the obvious outside layer down to the code that makes us all human, that drives our relationships and interactions with the people and the world around us. That's the foundation of our expertise. It's that annoying thing that you just can't turn off as you move around the world. It's when you are playing a game yourself and you're looking for any kind of indication that you're moving in the right direction or you're getting hit and you're looking all over the HUD for that one indicator and you finally see it. And where is it? Right there in the top right corner of the screen. And you're like, ah, why would they put that there? Maybe your berserk button is a different. This is mine. Subtitles is another one. But you know you have one. It's the trap that you hate to see, but you still see it every time because your brain is trained to find the code. That is everything. That is how we see the world. And that's a superpower because if we can see the strings of code, then we can tug on them too. And with more skill and accuracy than anyone else can. To me, research describes the discipline from which we come. It describes the lens through which we see the world. And yes, it defines a large part of what we do, but it's not a constraint on what we can do. It doesn't limit what we are capable of, what we can achieve as a field. It's more like a pair of wings. There's no such thing as that's not really the job for the researcher, because when the world is social and when we're in the age of social science, what isn't a job for a researcher do? What isn't a part of this field that we can't leave? We are all about dealing with ambiguity and complexity and making decisions in the midst of it all. Isn't your brain always searching, always going, 
That's what being able to see the matrix means once you've seen it long enough. You can't turn it off. It's an approach. It's a way of thinking about the world and it is useful across many, many contexts. Why would you not want someone who's used to wading ankle deep through data to fish out the right insights for making your big weighty decisions in the sea of ambiguity that we're in right now? Why would anyone not want a person with limited precognitive powers and only a moderate penchant for thinking I told you so to be your leader? Armed with that kind of power, there is literally nothing we can't do. And that's what I mean when I say that we are built for this moment. We are built, we're trained to be the ones at the forefront of our field, the ones driving it forward, solving the complex challenges of our now in the golden age of social science. This is our moment. <laughs>